go into the world and tell every man that you meet there is a man on the cross a catholic take what you need to know right now a bold synthesis of inspiration and information keeping you up to date on the news and issues from a courageous catholic perspective a Catholic Take with Joe McLean starts now. Praise be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to A Catholic Take, a bold synthesis of information and inspiration. I'm your host, Joe McLean. It's great to be on with you. Praise be to God. It's great to be back in the hot seat. You know, the weather outside, at least in Buffalo, is pretty frightful right now. I think I've had like five to six feet of snow in just the last couple of days. It's kind of been a big deal, to be honest with you. So uh, we were out of the studio yesterday. We're back in the saddle. Thanks to, I got to say, heroic measures by producer James pitching in today. Uh, Doing an all-nighter in the Buffalo studio. James, thanks for being on the team. We we do appreciate it. Making it possible for us to, to actually pull the show off today. Speaking of which, we are going to be talking about Malachi Martin. You remember Malachi Martin? What would Malachi Martin do? What would he say about times... Just like this. What would Maliki Martin say about Fiducia Suplicans, about Cardinal Fernandez and all the rest? Well, we're going to be talking about what Maliki Martin would say with Rob Morrow at 30 past the hour. He was a, a close personal friend. I think he was one of the last people to ever talk to Maliki Martin before he passed away. And he is in the process of writing a book about Maliki Martin right now. He'll join us at 30 past the hour to talk about that. And I think I'm going to share a little clip from Art Bell. Great, great, uh, great interview back in 1996. Andreas Weilzer from LifeSide News is on the team today at 14 past. What's going on at the WEF, the World Economic Forum? Davos. We're going to catch up to the witch doctor shenanigans going down in there in Switzerland. And he'll uh, he'll bring us all the latest news. All of that plus a lot more today. Sit back, relax, enjoy, but share us with a friend. Let's get started. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Remember, O most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known that anyone who fled to thy protection, implored thy help, or sought thine intercession was left unaided. Inspired by this confidence, I fly unto thee, O Virgin of virgins, my mother. To thee do I come, before thee I stand, sinful and sorrowful. O Mother of the Word incarnate, despise not my petitions, but in thy mercy hear and answer me. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and now your Saint of the Day. Saint Philan. Born in Ireland, Philan was the son of Feriach and Saint Cadigerna and related to Saint Calmwan. He became a monk in his youth, taking the habit at Saint Fintan Munu Monastery. Philan accompanied Cadigerna and Calmwan to Scotland in the 8th century. He was a hermit, living most of his life in prayer near the St. Andrew Monastery, and he built a church at Glendicart, Perthshire. He was abbot of St. Andrew's, and his bell and staff survive to this day. Legends and large tales naturally grew up around Philan. For example, a wolf is reported to have killed the ox Philan employed to work at the church construction site at Glendicart. When the wolf realized whose ox it was, it took the ox's place. For centuries after his death, The mentally ill were reported miraculously cured by being dipped in a fountain in the church, tied up, and left overnight near Philan's relics. Those whose bonds were loosed in the night were cured of their disorders. The victory of Robert the Bruce at Bannockburn was attributed to the presence of Philan's relics on the battlefield. Philan died of natural causes in 777. He was buried in Perthshire, Scotland, and has since been honored as the patron saint of mental disorders and the mentally ill. St. Philan, pray for us. And now your headline news. Breitbart reports Maine bill allows authorities to take kids away from parents who resist transgendering children. A bill being debated in Maine state legislature would give authorities the power to take away children from their parents who oppose allowing medical providers to impose gender affirming care. I say that in quotes, by the way, onto their children. These Uh, There seems to be no provision uh, made for religious objections. And the bill, if passed and signed into law, would make Maine one of other states like Washington, California, and New York, all who have eliminated parental rights in favor of the radical transgender movement. Why do we we live in states that do this? Hmm. 
Anyway, CNA reports teen hits major fundraising feat in attempt to save her childhood Catholic school. 17-year-old high school senior Susan Lutsky may have successfully saved her childhood Catholic elementary school from closing after she raised more than $400,000 to address the institution's financial difficulties. The principal of St. Bede's School in Ingleside, Illinois, announced on December the 13th that if the money wasn't raised by January the 26th, the school might have to close. The crowdfunding campaign almost instantly began generating funds with almost 900 donations ranging from $10 to $50,000. Susan Lutsky said her experience at St. B was, quote, really positive. It's a smaller school, so classes are always super close together. And I'm still in contact with the people I was classmates with. It was really just a big family, and it was a really great experience for me, close quote, she said. That's a great story. LifeSite News reports Kentucky Bishop removes two Latin Mass priests from public ministry. Oh, this is not a great story. Father Shannon Collins and Father Sean Kopensky are members of the Missionaries of St. John the Baptist, a public association of the faithful established in the Diocese of Covington back in 2019 before the arrival of the current Bishop John Efert. The Bishop of Covington, Kentucky, removed from public ministry these two beloved priests who offer the traditional Latin Mass. LifeSite News has learned that Collins was removed for preaching a, quote, divisive sermon, close quote, several months ago that the diocese said undermined the unity in the church. In it, Collins refers to the Novus Ordo liturgy and the, quote, Novus Ordo membership of the church, close quote, as being, quote, largely against the old order of things, close quote. LifeSite has also learned that uh, Father Collins refused to celebrate a Novus Ordo Mass with Efert, which is actually pretty typical for those types of religious communities. And those, those are your headline news. The gospel today comes to us from Mark chapter 3, verses 13 through 19. Jesus went up the mountain and summoned those whom he wanted, and they came to him. He appointed twelve whom he had also named apostles, that they might be with him, and he might send them forth to preach and to have authority to drive out demons. He appointed the twelve, Simon, whom he named Peter, James, son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, whom he named Boanangers, that is, the sons of thunder, Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, the son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanian, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Haydock's Catholic Bible Commentary today says, He spent here the whole night in prayer, not that he, he who had all things to bestow stood in need of prayer, or had anything to ask, but to teach us that we must undertake nothing without previously recommending the affair to heaven in humble and fervent prayer. He leads by example. He's God. He doesn't, he doesn't need the effects of prayer. He is God. But he shows us. He leads by example. He gets on his knees. He prays fervently all night to teach and show us the way that we must go. And then, of course, he calls his apostles after an all-nighter of prayer. That's some self-sacrifice right there. The number, the, the commentary goes on to say, the number 12 is mystical, as appeareth by choosing Matthias to fill, to fill up the place of Judas. There They are the 12 foundations under Christ of the heavenly Jerusalem in Apocalypse chapter 21. A Catholic commentary in Holy Scripture says, the 12 disciples now specially chosen by Christ were to be the duly accredited witnesses who would proclaim the message of salvation after the death of Christ, hence the solemnity attached to their calling. It is significant that Simon Peter is placed first in all of the lists of the apostles. Though there is some variation in the order of the others, with the exception of Judas, who is always placed last. Simon Peter is always first. Judas is always last. Every time in the in the New Testament, that's significant. That's important. I used to remember having you know conversations, debates with non Catholics about the primacy of Saint Peter. And I think it's especially interesting in a day and a time where 
yours truly can be somewhat, well, let's just say, a lot of times very critical of what comes out of the current occupant of the chair of St. Peter. And it's a tricky piece of business. We believe in the primacy of St. Peter, the first among bro- brother apostles. We believe in the office and uh, of, uh, of the keys of St. Peter that gets passed on down through the generations in the unbroken chain of successors. There are moments in between uh, successors where there will be the, the chair is empty, waiting for its next occupant. But nonetheless, we have an unbroken chain. And there are moments in time when there are anti-popes. There were pretender popes. There were competitors for sure. But it all got worked out in the end. And we still have this unbroken line. This is the promise of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And it is not It is not the promise of the man wearing white. It is the promise of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Hadock's Catholic Bible Commentary says, He gave also two sons of Zebedee the name of Boanangers from the Syriac. Father McKeeley says, Boanangers, which is the sons of thunder, that is, the thunderers, why he gave them this name is variously accounted for. Some say it was because of the wonderful, powerful power and energy they displayed in announcing or thundering to the world the truths of the gospel, which made James to be such an object of hatred to Herod as to be apprehended by him and put to death. I love it. Would that we would all err on the side of zealousness for the Lord. Faithfulness, to be sure. Zealousness. Are we zealous? Do we thunder the truth to a world that needs to hear it? Or are we too afraid of our own shadows and we remain very quiet because we don't want to rock the boat? Speak now or forever hold your peace because that clock is ticking and all of us, all of us will have to face the judge soon enough. The Station of the Cross Catholic Media Network presents Saints and Seasons. On January 19th, we celebrate the feast of St. Wolston of Worcester, Bishop and Confessor. Wolston was born in Warwickshire in the early 11th century to a mother and father who later agreed to separate and take religious vows. Wolston himself was devoted to abstinence in all matters from an early age, having thrown himself into a thicket at his first temptation to lust and given up meat for life after the smell of a roast distracted him during Mass. Wolston studied for the priesthood at Worcester and went on to serve in several offices at the Benedictine Abbey there. A deeply humble man, he was reluctant to accept the office of Bishop of Worcester, but he was nonetheless consecrated such in the year of our Lord, 1062, and he still governed that see when the Normans conquered England in 1066. He was the only English-born bishop to retain his see long after the conquest, owing to a miracle, much like that of the sword and the stone, involving his bishop's crozier and a statue of King St. Edward the Confessor, who held the English throne when Wollstone received the mire. He counseled rebellious Englishmen to bear the Norman yoke with humility as a chastisement, and lived in such a saintly manner himself until his death in 1095. Also honored on this day are Saints Marius and Martha, and their sons Audifax and Abacum, St. Germanicus, St. Pontian, St. Bassian, and many other martyrs, confessors, and holy virgins. For more about the saints and seasons of the Catholic Church, visit thestationofthecross.com forward slash saints and seasons. Praise be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to A Catholic Take, a bold synthesis of information and inspiration. I'm your host, Joe McLean. It's good to be on with you. Coming up at 30 past the hour, we're going to have a conversation about what would Malachi Martin say about the current crisis in the church? How would he react to Fiducia Supplicans and Cardinal Fernandez's uh, interesting, let's just say, book that was discovered recently? Or any of the scandals in the church today? Rob Morrow, personal friend and assistant, one of the last persons to have talked to Malachi Martin before he died, will join us at 30 past the hour to talk about that. And I think I'm going to play a clip from Art Bell's interview back in 1996 with Father Malachi Martin, because I think it sets it up very well. All of that coming up after the break. But uh, there's lots of stories and of great concern to us, and I'm sure they are to you as well, to include the WEF, that what's going on in Davos right now. I read to you the letter of Pope Francis that he sent to Klaus Schwab the other day. That's uh, That video is on the YouTube channel. You can check that out. It's also in the podcast, if I'm not mistaken. But here's an article out of LifeSite News. Now, this is fascinating. Heritage Foundation president tells Davos future Trump admin must reject all of WEF ideas. Now, two things is interesting. One, I know Kevin Roberts personally. I've known him for a long time. 
Not that he takes my calls anymore now that he's the president of the Heritage Foundation. But nonetheless, great guy. Always has been. Uh, very straightforward. And uh, number two is he said this to the WEF at the WEF, which makes it even more impressive. Here to talk about what's going on there in Switzerland is Andreas Weilzer of LifeSide News. Good morning to you, Andreas. Welcome back to the team. Good morning, Joe. Thank you for having me. Praise be to God. Uh, glad for your time today. So Davos, WEF uh, over there. I, you know, I, one of the things I reported was there was a story out that said uh, all of the pimps, the human traffickers, were bringing in all of their sex slaves into Davos to uh, to meet the demand of these world elites flying in on their private jets and, and the like, which is, I mean, bald faced hypocrisy of what they what they're what they all the the stuff that they talk about. Plus, you have the witch doctor shenanigans and uh, the global tax, the global carbon emissions, all that stuff. Is uh, are, are we seeing anything different or new this year? No, not necessarily anything new. I mean, I think the themes are very similar. Um, you know, there's uh, climate change is, of course, one of the big ones. So they're talking a lot about AI. Um, although what is interesting is that uh, World Economic Forum put out a report that said the number one risk in the world is actually misinformation. So not climate change or the next pandemic or whatever, but misinformation, which is interesting because that was one of the themes of, of the whole conference was the idea that misinformation is so dangerous and that we need to fight back on it uh, against it. And I think one of the targets that they have, and they, they, he was also mentioned a couple of times, is Elon Musk and X, formerly Twitter, which is sort of the biggest free speech platform that we have right now that, that censors nothing or, or not a lot at least. Mm. So that is one of their targets, and that was a big theme of wow. the whole conference. Another big theme was they are all very, very scared of a future Trump administration or any Republican uh, administration that will come up in 2024. They mentioned that like almost during every talk, they, they mentioned that somehow, that this is a big risk and it's going to you know, uh, hurt global collaboration and so on. Of course, he framed it in a way that, that it would be really terrible. But what it really said is that, yeah, you know, that's not going to be aligned with the WEF agenda if Trump or some somebody else from the Republican Party is going to be elected. Yeah. Um, I'm all of a sudden I'm hearing George Soros in my head telling us uh, how much he uh, disliked a potential Trump administration way back in 2016 and how short it would be if he he got elected, and uh, college you is. It's been a bumpy ride ever since. Um, can before we jump further into like down that path, let me back up and ask about the shaman. There's a pagan ritual that got performed at the WF. Was this at the opening of this? And why in the world would they open with a pagan ceremony? I mean, if that doesn't tell you what's going on there, I'm not sure what else will. Uh, no, that wasn't during the opening. That was during some uh, some panel event. I, I don't know exactly why it was. And it was apparently a prayer, like she said, some kind of pagan prayer for, uh, you know, for the earth and, and, and for the climate and for unity in the world. And yeah, I think, you know, there is a certain religious connotation to some of these things. And I think they're not, you know, not from God, but but actually from from the other side, from the devil. And uh, there's a professor, uh, a Finnish professor called, I'm going to mispronounce his name probably, but he's called Miko, uh, Miko Punio. And he uh, did a lot of research about, and he wrote books about the WEF and about Klaus Schwab. And his claim is that they're, you know, the founders of the WEF are basically practicing a kind of occultism, kind of nature pantheism. Mm. These are strong claims. You know, you, you have an interview with that on LifeSide News. You can check it out and make up your own mind what you think about it. But however that may be, there's certainly a religious connotation to some of these things, like that pagan ritual that was the most overt. But for instance, El Gore, in one of his speeches, he's one of the you know most foremost climate alarmists and he compared the climate change to the book of revelation and to the apocalypse and he referred to the earth as mother nature and and so on so these are certainly uh religious themes um that are being used here and i don't think they're they're good ones wow you know, it's sad, especially since uh, uh, Christianity uh, plays such a significant part of European history to see so many Europeans um, throw Christianity away and embrace this uh, this pagan 
uh, ideology once again. It's really heartbreaking to see that. And then, of course, uh, Javier Mille, the new president president of Ar- Argentina, uh, who is. Uh, I mean, he's just the hits just keep on coming. Apparently, he had a very explosive speech there at the World Economic Forum. What did he do? Yeah, so that was definitely the highlight and the, the the most viral moment was his speech. It was also shared by Elon Musk and by many, many other people online. So that was definitely like the most viewed event. And he essentially, he gave, he started out by giving a talk of sort of pro-capitalism against socialism and how the international organizations, he didn't name the WF, but it was pretty clear that's what he means or mm. one of them, is infiltrated by this neo-Marxism and, and this kind of uh, this, this socialism or the socialist ideas. But then he really, you know, he, he, he really um, made a really strong statement that surprised me. I, I, I didn't expect that because then he started talking about uh, population control. Like he, he criticized the climate change agenda and he started about, you know, they're using population control and even the called bloody abortion agenda. Um, to you know, carry out this population control, and that was really a strong statement. That was something you know, for us. I think for everyone that is in the pro-life community that that cares about unborn life, that was amazing to see him bring up that issue that is so um, divisive, and that you know. Everyone, I guess, expected him to talk about economics because he's an economist, but to actually bring up abortion, that yeah. is actually. I don't think this has ever been done at the, at the World Economic Forum. So that is, I think, a milestone moment. Whatever you think of Xavier Millet, you know, he has his downsides as well. But that, that was a big moment and, and, and a good one, I think. Mm. Speaking of economics, they're calling for a global tax. I saw you tweeting about that this morning, too. Yeah, they 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 said they they want a, a global carbon tax essentially because you know if you have just if you just have it in one country then you can escape it and uh, go to another country and and they want to prevent that and uh, of course again it's all to save us and, and to save the climate so it's all for for our good according to them um, but we're gonna introduce a global tax and of course how are you gonna do that you, you need global governance and and mm-hmm. and. That's what the UN Secretary General talked about, global governance. And so you see it's all going to toward in the direction of centralized power of, of a sort of new world government um, or sort of new world order. Um, they, they've used these terms, you know, again and again. And whether that's, you know, through the WEF or some other organization remains to be seen, but it's definitely going more into this globalist uh, centralization. Yeah. Going back to Kevin Roberts, too, uh, the, from the Heritage Foundation, I don't, I guess, I, I, I depend upon people like you, Andreas, to cover this stuff and to really look into it. I guess I don't, I don't put enough effort into it, but I don't recall in previous years there being critics of the WEF being invited to present their criticisms of the WF, quite like this one. In the clip that you actually link to at your article, and we're going to link to it, it's LifesideDews.com's article on Heritage Foundation President tells Davos, future Trump admin must reject all WEF ideas. Has this been a thing in the past? Has the WEF invited other critics of their agenda, of their platform, of their ideas to come and express those criticisms? I don't think so. Usually not. Not someone like Robert who would actually make, you know, these kind of arguments. I mean, Trump was there a few years ago and he was also fairly critical, not of the WF directly, but of sort of globalism. But he is the president of the U.S. So you kind of have to invite him, I, I suppose. Um, while Kevin Roberts, he is, he's, you know, a, a, a leader of a think tank of the Heritage Foundation. So, yeah, that, that was a bit surprising. He said himself before and that he was a bit surprised as well as he was invited and, uh, but that he, and he didn't want to go, but he said, yeah, he, w- he wants to, to use this opportunity to, you know, tell them off basically, um, which I think, I think it, w- it was a good thing to see. I mean, and, yeah. uh, you know, that there's at least some pushback. I think many people in the room were probably really shocked that, they've probably never been criticized like that to their faces. I think a lot yes. of them because they're, they're living in such a bubble. You can, you can see when, when you watch these events, they're in such an elitist bubble and they don't even, they don't understand this, the, you know, sort of the concerns of the everyday people at all. Yeah. At least that's yeah. what it seems to me. I've asked you this question before, as we're going to be running out of time here in just a moment. And I want to ask it again. So these, these, the participants at the conference, They hear all these presentations, they have the cocktail hours, they do their thing, they're socializing, they're sharing ideas, and then they go back to their home countries. How much influence 
actually happens back at the home uh, government offices from this event. Is it just like a good time that they go and hang out and they share their progressive agendas, but then they go home, they don't, they just kind of keep moving in the way that they were going to move anyway? Or do some of these progressive ideas actually get implemented? No, I think they definitely get that implemented. I mean, there's the famous quote from from Klaus Schwab from from a couple of years ago, where he said that the young global leaders of the World Economic Forum have uh, penetrated the cabinets of the world. Like Justin Trudeau was a young global leader at, at the WEF, Jacinda Ardern of of New Zealand, um, Emmanuel Macron of France. So many of them are, you know have been trained by the World Economic Forum. And um, so, yeah, I mean, I guess it always depends on the person. Not not everyone is going to implement this. You know, there's a lot of entrepreneurs there who just, you know, basically see this as a business opportunity, as, as a business meeting where, where they network. But, you know, I think especially the politicians, a lot of them are are um, moving along that agenda and, and um, you know, implementing some of the things that the, the, the WEF uh, wants to like the you know carbon tax and the climate change and tackling misinformation and all these kind of things um yeah, so. well we're out of time here with andreas Weilzer. i'd love to get you back maybe next week and uh get you back on to talk about these uh, protests these farmers protests now in germany i mean we've been talking about that this past week it seems like that's a big deal are we going to see changes as a result of these massive pushbacks in several European countries, I don't know. But Andreas, I'd like to have you back next week. Maybe we can schedule that. Thanks for thanks for helping us better understand WEF and Davos this year. God bless you and God love you. We'll be linking to your articles. LifesideNews.com. Coming up after the break, I have more breaking news and stories for you. And then Rob Morrow is on the team to talk about what would Maliki Martin do in times just like this. I got a clip from his Art Bell interview. I'm going to start off with that one. All of that plus a lot more is headed your way after this short break. Do us a favor, though, and share us with a friend. We'll be right back. Don't go anywhere. Praise be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to A Catholic Tick, a bold synthesis of information and inspiration. I'm your host, Joe McLean, and here, here are your headline news. Daily Wire reports China conducts large military maneuvers around Taiwan as fears of invasion loom. Taiwan's Ministry of National Defense said that China's military conducted air and naval operations near the island nation Wednesday night with 24 planes and five ships. The military exercises came after Taiwan elected Lai ching of the Democratic Progressive Party last week to become the nation's next president. His victory marks the first time that a political party in Taiwan has won a third straight presidential election. The DPP has vowed political independence from China and views Taiwan as its own sovereign nation. LifeSite News reports, was he confused? Pro-abortion President Joe Biden tells pro-lifers to march in Friday's 2024 March for Life. On Thursday, a reporter for the Catholic broadcaster EWTN caught up with the current president and asked him, quote, the March for Life is tomorrow in Washington, D.C. What's your message to those attending? Close quote. After saying something inaudible during the question, Biden answered simply, March, and then walked away. Biden has called on Congress to send to his desk a federal law that would codify Roe v. Wade and protect, quote, every woman's constitutional right to choose abortion, close quote. Such a women's health, such as Women's Health Protection Act or Freedom of Choice Act, either of which would not only prohibit state level abortion bans, but make it impossible for states to enact any meaningful limits or regulations on abortions. Earlier this month, Biden's principal deputy campaign manager, Quentin Folks, told NBC News that abortion would be the president's top priority in a second term. Ground News reports U.S. spaceship burns up over South Pacific after failed moon mission. A U.S. spacecraft, Peregrine 1, launched by Astrobotic, ended its mission prematurely due to the propulsion fault and was commanded to destroy itself instead of landing on the moon. Astrobotic's goal was to deliver five NASA instruments to the moon's surface, but the failed landing meant the mission could not be completed. Astrobotic is part of a private-public partnership with NASA alongside Intuitive Machines and Firefly, planning a total of six missions to the lunar surface in 2024. And those, those are your headline news. Let me just set this up for you. This is, an, uh, this is a clip 
I'm going to play a couple of minutes here from a clip from Art Bell uh, interviewing Father Malachi Martin back in 1996. Have a listen to this. When Pope John Paul II be forced to resign, opposing forces battle for power over pivotal issues. Will there be a Mr. and Mrs. Pope? Will women be ordained Catholic priests? Are traditional Christians on the way back to the catacombs? Will homosexual marriages be sanctioned? The long-running covert warfare against Pope John Paul II, led by powerful members of his own hierarchy, including cardinals and bishops in Rome, in the U.S. and around the world, has broken into the open over the past five months. It's going to end within the next 12. The prize is control of one of the world's most powerful positions. So predicts former Vatican insider and best-selling author Dr. Malachi Martin. In his latest national bestseller, Windswept House. It's a double-day book. Already recognized as, quote, one of the most powerful books of the decade, end quote. As in his earlier bestsellers, uh, Vatican and the Final Conclave, Father Martin again draws aside the thick veil of secrecy that surrounds the world's oldest political power and vast financial empire known as the Vatican. This time he unveils a deadly global war, a winner-take-all campaign aimed at the target of targets control of the power cockpit of the world, a war for control of the papacy itself as a nerve center of the only up-and-running, self-sustaining, worldwide governing structure. And this evening, I think what I'm going to do is let um, uh, Dr. Uh, Martin uh, speak for himself. But before he does, Dr. Welcome to the program. Um, how would you prefer to be addressed? Uh, Malachi, Dr. Martin, Father uh, Martin? I think uh, under the circumstances, seeing that uh, I'm known to you and you're known to me and your listeners, I think I'd better be called Malachi Martin. Everybody knows I'm a Roman Catholic priest, a okay. practicing one, and that I have several doctorates. And let's not emphasize either aspect. Just call me by my name, Malachi Martin. I love it. Here to talk about this is his good friend. Uh, one of the last persons to ever talk to Maliki Martin before he died, Father Maliki Martin, is Rob Mara. M- Rob, well, good morning to you. Thanks for being on with us. Good morning, Joe. Can you hear me? Praise be to God. We can hear you, and we're grateful that you're on the ha- on the line. Uh, Father Maliki Martin, that's a great clip from uh, from Art Bell's interview back in 1996. It sets the stage quite clearly. And is, if you didn't mention the name of JP too, you'd have thunk that they were talking about Pope Francis in our current times. That is how um, how long the struggle goes back. That is how detailed the struggle was in those days and how well they compare to these days, wouldn't you say? Exactly. And, and I would also emphasize, Joe, that the struggle doesn't only go back to the time when Malachi Martin was commenting on it. It goes back well over 130, 140 years before he actually made those statements mm. to when – as you know, the uh, as my friend Anthony Stein likes to call them, the stonecutters uh, had made their infamous document called the Permanent Instruction of the Alta Vendita for the infiltration of the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, Malachi spoke about that at length in several chapters in his 1986 book entitled The Keys of This Blood. Yeah. You know, some people, we've talked about this before the last time we had you on the show, Rob. Uh, was was Father Malachi Martin, was he a prophet? Was he j- just, did he just know where all the bones were buried? I mean, how insightful was Malachi Martin? Well, I think he was very, I think he was very insightful because um, you know, a lot of people are familiar with him from his time with, uh, with Art Bell. All right. However, if you want to get a true grasp of the the real um, what you would call foresight that Malachi Martin had, the best thing to do would be to listen to his uh, his uh, interviews with Bernard Jansen of Triumph Communications. And they're available through Triumph online only because, and I've said this before, uh, with Art Bell, you know, Art Bell being kind of a free for all call in show. Father Martin Malachi had to he had to deal with what I called every wing nut on the planet that got past the call screener. Yeah. And so, you know, sometimes the call screener would let through questions about vampires, werewolves and aliens. And Malachi had to deal with them all in a very, very charitable way because that was his nature. It, it, it really took a lot to anger him. Um, so I would say, you know, the best place you know, there's uh, Peter in Chains, uh, Crossing the Desert. They're just a couple of his interviews that people can hear through Triumph Communications. 
And I know that a number of them have also been pirated onto YouTube. Mm. So, you know, it's fascinating because when we do listen to like the examples of what you just said in his Art Bell conversations, it it is wild conversation. He, he talked to a former military officer that used remote seeing to try to, you know, do intelligence gatherings and things like that. And they talked about the diabolical element to that. And aliens came up as well, which I found fascinating because if I go to read the headlines today, you've got whistleblowers on Capitol Hill, uh, you know, uh, uh, supposedly, allegedly speaking of biologics and spacecraft from another planet. And it does feel like aliens are a part of the program to usher in the final era of mankind. And Maliki Martin talked about that with Art Bill. He, he seemed to indicate that aliens would be leveraged by the diabolical forces towards this end. Isn't that fascinating? I think you put your, your finger on it when you mentioned the word diabolical. Because we have to remember that entities from the world of the demonic are preternatural. You know, our blessed Lord referred to uh, Lucifer as the prince of this world. So he is able to leverage phenomena and the laws of physics to do things that to mere humans must seem like they're miraculous. Mm -hmm. I'm not an expert. I'm not an expert on UFOs or um, as, as because the UFO now has such a, a tint to the conversation. Um, the U.S. government now refers to them by the acronym UAVs, Unidentified Aerial Vehicles, which is another way of saying UFO. That's like saying, am I lying to you? No, I'm telling you a strategic misrepresentation. Yeah, you know, but I, I, be, I believe there's an element of the demonic behind it. We um, had a conversation with Luce, Daniel O'Connor about that a couple of months ago. Now, I suppose, about his brand new book, and he's, I think, he lays it out better than than most in his new book on that subject with tons of detail. But I found it fascinating. Father Malachi Martin called that, you know, what is that, thirty years ago now? I mean, so he knew that that was going to be a part of the strategy, and he was uh, basically warning us at that time. But I wonder. Um, how do you think Father Maliki Martin would re would respond or react to fiducia supercons? Would he be at all surprised by this? Uh, the office that was once called holy is now uh, putting out fiducia supercons. The guy who wrote fiducia, fiducia supercons is the ghost writer of Amoris Laetitia. And, of course, we now know a writer of what we would consider very pornographic material back in the 90s when, when Father Maliki Martin's on our bell Cart, the, you know, Fernandez was writing this book at that time, essentially. What would he say to that? Maliki would have called him out as an apostate. Clear, clear and simple. He was fearless. You know, by that time, he had already written his uh, his magnum opus regarding the current church, Windswept House. And he pulled no punches. He said 90 percent of Windswept House was accurate in the events that it portrayed he said he just altered the names because in his in his exact words, I want to keep my kneecaps. Hmm. But, you know, he at the time, you have to realize a very wicked but influential cardinal, Cardinal Bernardin, was still active in Chicago. And I often wondered if he was so influential, why didn't he have Malachi Martin squashed like a bug? I mean, when you look at the power an influence and reach, not mm. just in the church, but within the secular world. Why didn't he have Maliki squashed like a bug? And it's because, number one, Maliki knew where the bodies were buried. Oof. And number two is, and I mean that figuratively and literally, and number two, he knew that Maliki was very, very close to Pope John Paul II. Wow. You know, um, I was just thinking, what were Maliki Martin's opinions of Cardinal Bernardin? What, what were his opinions of Cardinal Spellman at that time? What, what would he have said? And it's very interesting because in the Art Bell clip that I played, if you go on to listen to it, Father Mar Martin actually says that he asked to be dispensed of his uh, vow of poverty so that he could provide for his own living. He asked to be dispensed of his vow of obedience so they didn't have to... He didn't have to answer to men with, with suspect theology. 
I find that utterly fascinating, which makes me really want to ask him, God, what, what do you think of Cardinal Spellman? What do you think of Cardinal Bernadine? I mean, in hindsight, we, we can see the issues, but did he see them at that time? Yes, he did. We'll start with Cardinal Spellman. He said he knew how to play the what he called play the orthodox card. In other words, in all uh, official pronouncements and public actions, uh, both in and out of the church, he knew how to put on the proper face. He knew how to do things in a Roman Catholic way that would not call uh, negative attention to himself. He said, but behind the scenes, he says it was common knowledge within the Curia and the United States uh, cardinals and bishops that Cardinal Spellman was an active homosexual. Wow. Wow. The wolves. In and I'm not, clothing. and I'm, I'm not the only person to say that. I mean, in these instances, Joe, Google is your best friend. Yeah. Hold that thought. Rob Morrow is our guest talking about father Malachi Martin. God rest his soul. And what he would say, how he would react to Fiducia Subicans, the current crisis in the church and all the rest. Well, he kind of did. He just did it 30 years ago, 40 years ago. He did it in a uh, mysterious way in some ways. And in other ways, it was pretty, pretty spot on. It could be exactly comments made for our time and our day. And we're having a conversation with Rob Morrow about that. One of the last people to ever talk to Father Mal- Malachi Martin before he died. And who was also putting together a book on that. And we'll talk about that coming up after the break. We'll also get him to comment on Cardinal Bernadine as well. So we'll pick up right there, right after this break. Do us a favor and share us with a friend. We're going to put links to everything in the show notes over at thestationofthecross.com forward slash A-C-T. Hey, we'll be right back. Don't go anywhere. be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to A Catholic Tick, a bold synthesis of information and inspiration. I'm your host, Joe McLean. It's great to be on with you. Coming up at the top of the hour, we say goodbye to the radio audience. We stay on the live video feed for another half hour for what we call the after show. And I think Rob's going to be hanging out with us. So if you got questions about Malachi Martin, might be a great opportunity to get some in. And uh, I'm already seeing some good ones in the chat, by the way. So praise be to God. Stand by for that. But uh, we're having a conversation around Father Malachi Martin. What would he say? about these times that we live in. And uh, Rob Morrow is our guest. Right after, right before the break, we were talking about what his opinions were of Cardinal Spellman and Bernadine. And uh, at the time, they, I mean, both of these guys in many circles today, they're still looked upon as heroes of the church, you know, big figures of the church, although they've both been passed and they still have very scandalous backgrounds. But nonetheless, see, even today in many of these suburban parishes, Catholics will bring up, they'll name Spellman, they'll name Bernadine. Isn't Bernadine the uh, the, the seamless garment guy? So what was, what was Malachi Martin's opinion of Cardinal Bernadine? He said that, as he reflected in his book, Windswept House, he said that Cardinal Bernadine was kind of the leader of the, what I would call the, the Luciferian element within the church in the United States in the U.S. hierarchy, Uh, because you have to realize we need to draw a distinction between Luciferian and Satanist, because there is a there's a clear dividing line, Joe. Um, If you're not familiar, I can give you the 15 second recap, please. Okay, Satanists are people who are actually formally devoted to the rites and the rituals, the black mass uh, devoted to the fallen uh, archangel. So they are the ones who practice Satanism as a formal religion, which is an inversion of the Roman Catholic uh, Tridentine mass, by the way, not the Novus Ordo. Satanists do not use the Novus Ordo in the black mass. They use an inversion of the Tridentine right. Wow. Um, people who are Luci- people who are Luciferian, on the other hand, they can be Satanists, but they don't have to be. People who are Luciferians are those people like Marxists or diehard Marxist Leninists, etc., who deny the transcendent element of God and the salvific plan of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. They just say that. The only thing that exists is what we can see, 
feel, touch, taste, and smell with our senses, and that there is no transcendent reality beyond it, that the only thing that exists is this world, so grab what you can for yourself while you're still alive, and to heck with everyone else. Mm. We did see a big push. I remember talking to Dr. Paul Kengore last year about Bella Dodd and her efforts to inf- help to assist infiltrating seminaries with communists uh, under you know wanting to be become priests, and that infiltration was real. It's, and I would say it's the best documented evidence to date on what she did or did not do, and what the Communist Party in the USA did or didn't do, let alone worldwide. So I think the evidence is is abundantly clear that there was definitely an effort by. Uh, by these nefarious actors, these Luciferians, as you say, uh, to subvert the Holy Mother Church. And then we see that, I mean, Cardinal McCarrick, how else can we explain? We we interviewed James Grind just recently, twice actually, on the Cardinal McCarrick's. To this day, uh, we still do not know how the man was able to rise to power, uh, come back from being suppressed. Why does he always have uh, envelopes of cash to hand out to everybody? You know, what was his involvement in lobbying at the conclave that elected Pope Francis? I mean, we don't have solid answers to any of these questions, and it seems like we never will because certain actors don't want us to to know these. Is that why uh, Maliki Martin wrote books like Windswept House so that he could name names without naming them? That's correct. That, that's precisely correct. Although I believe in Windswept House, he did not name Cardinal McCarrick, uh, who was not a cardinal at that time. I believe he was uh, Archbishop of Newark, but he was he was not a cardinal. However, he still at the time was very influential. At the time, he had his infamous beach house in Seagirt, New Jersey, and I lived in the small town of Manasquan, which was it was a small lake that separated the two towns right on the Jersey seashore. And it was well known back. I would say back as far as 1993, 94, when I was active with St. St. Agnes's Catholic church in New York, it was well known about, you know, uh, McCarrick's everyone called it his retreat center down the Jersey shore. And it was always done with a kind of a wink and a nod. It was an open secret. It's, this is, these are insane times that we live in that we know these things go on and we don't do anything about them until until just everything really gets very ugly and bad. I mean, how many how many young men were abused that could have been saved from that abuse if those that knew that had power and authority and could do something did that did something at the time? It's uh, it's a uh, it's a shameful reality, I think, that we have to come to grips with. But let me ask you this. You got this book coming out that you're trying to. You're trying to get written and published on your life, your experience with Father Maliki Martin. Tell us about where that project is. Uh, right now, I'm actively writing the book. It's, it's a bit of a slow go, only because of my, my physical challenges. Uh, but I'm in the active writing part of it. The book proposal, which I had done the fundraising campaign for several months for last year, the book proposal was ultimately written and has been circulated to a number of publishing houses. If none of them, what they call bite at the proposal, then it'll be released on Amazon, uh, Amazon and Amazon Kindle. Mm. So, but the, but the book, the book is, the book is underway. The book is, is the book is um, underway. When do you anticipate, like, do you have a projected publishing date? Are we looking at 2024? Could it be 2025? When do you think it'll come out? I would say if it goes the Amazon route, it may be out as early as Thanksgiving of this year. Oh wow! If it goes okay. the tradition, if it goes the traditional publishing route, there are so many editorial checks and balances to make sure that it's, you know, every I is dotted and T is crossed. That it could be sometime in the first half of 2025. Wow! Tease us a bit here. Okay. What uh, what juicy tidbits are we are we going to learn? I mean, you don't have to give away give it away, but tease us a little bit. What 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 are we going to learn in this book once it does get released? You'll learn about uh, experiences of his early life that among a few confidants have never been shared with the wider world and they're extremely edifying. Mm. Uh, you'll learn a bit about his, about his his family life. His uh, 
especially his father. His father was a very noble and distinguished man who was uh, also, he was a doctor who also branched out into uh, the OBGYN world. Oh, wow. So he, yes. And he came from a fairly large family where, interestingly enough, uh, almost all of his brothers went into the priesthood and went on to become renowned in their own specific academic fields within the priesthood of uh, of the pastoral and moral theology. Interesting. And then there's wow. also there's also his experiences behind the Iron Curtain, as well as some tidbits about exorcism that are not particularly known to the wider world, only because. Joe, are you familiar with the movie Nefarious? Yes, of course. Okay. I contrast that against Russell Crow- Russell Crowe's movie, uh, The Pope's Exorcist, and it was sure. the movie Nefarious that was much more accurate. Yes. Let's, uh, let's pause there. We're going to go into what we call the after show. It's live on the uh, live video feed, which you can always find linked up. On the website at thestationofthecross.com forward slash ACT. If you scroll down, you'll see the live video feed player there. And underneath it, you'll see icons. There's uh, YouTube, there's Facebook. But if you join the insider email list at thestationofthecross.com forward slash ACT, you get instant access to the private Telegram group for the insiders where we hang out 24-7, share our life, our faith. Our questions, our conversations, debates, and so much more. That's typically where I share all my personal stuff. Just go to thestationofthecross.com forward slash ACT. We'll see you on Monday. God love you.